You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Okay, in this session, we're going to take a look at socialism and progressive reform, and this is the, the third part. And um, let's understand something about how socialism influenced progressive reform. Now, while Theodore Roosevelt created the square deal between capital and labor, President Woodrow Wilson will follow through on progressive reform as a Democrat during his first administration and prior to U.S. involvement in World War I. Now, his deal between capital and labor will be called the New Freedom. Now, under the New Freedom, Wilson's administration will create a postal savings, a Bureau of Mines, a Children's Bureau, and a separate Department of Labor, taking it away from Congress. Wilson will also ensure the passage of the 16th and 17th Amendments to the Constitution, which called for the direct election of senators, and most importantly, the implementation of an income tax designed to ensure that the rich pay their fair share of the burden. Now, perhaps the most important legislation uh, for labor unions under Wilson's new freedom was the Clayton Act of 1914. And this act established the right <clears throat> to strike by workers. Now, before this act, management was powerful in determining the work pace, the wages and the working conditions of the factories and the workplaces. In fact, the Sherman Antitrust Act which was designed to prevent the restraint of trade practiced by corporations in the rush to monopolize markets, was used against workers when they attempted to form labor unions or when they attempted to strike to form labor unions. Labor unions and strikes, it was reasoned, interfered with the free flow of trade. Well, the Clayton Act legitimized the activities of unions, but the Clayton Act will be invalidated once the United States enters World War I. So the Clayton Act assisted in the organizing efforts of one of the most important unions in American labor history. And those, that union was known as the Industrial Workers of the World. They were better known as the IWW, whose nickname became the Wobblies. Now the IWW was founded in Chicago in June 1905 at a convention of 200 socialists, anarchists, and radical trade unionists from all over the United States. And mainly, they were from the Western Federation of Miners. And they were opposed to the policies of the American Federation of Labor. The IWW's goal was to promote worker solidarity in the revolutionary struggle to overthrow the employing class. And its motto was, an injury to one is an injury to all. Now, <clears throat> the Wobblies differed from other union movements at the time by its promotion of what is known as industrial unionism. It was opposed to the craft unionism of the American Federation of Labor. The IWW emphasized rank and file organization as opposed to empowering leaders who would bargain with employers on behalf of workers. So let's learn about a very important strike and the result of that strike was known as the Bisbee deportation. You know, the great socialist tradition of the American immigrant worker is going to find fruition in the organizing efforts of workers in one of the most important strikes that brought the Wobblies and, the Me and Mexican miners together in a place called Bisbee, Arizona. So let's understand what happened when white workers attempted to unite with Mexican workers during World War I with the hope of creating racial equality and the elimination of a dual wage system. Let's appreciate what came to be known as the Bisbee deportation. And let's not be surprised at what Arizona is attempting to do today. By 1915, a new union had entered Arizona. The International Workers of the World, better known as the Wobblies, were motivated by socialist ideals and dedicated to the overthrow of capitalism. The IWW was looked upon as being a radical movement made up of unpatriotic Americans who were suspect of having um, communistic tendencies. The IWW wanted to represent the working class. The IWW wanted to represent the immigrant. 
and the IWW especially wanted to represent the Mexican immigrant. The demand was that everyone be treated equally on the job. The men of the union were demanding that they be recognized and there be no discrimination against anyone because of race, religion, or uh, uh, national origin. World War I brought the Mineros, the Wobblies, and the mining companies into a sharp confrontation. With the country at war, the demand for copper rose astronomically. In two years, the price of copper had jumped from 13 cents to 27 cents a pound. By 1917, Phelps Dodge reported a 218% increase in net profits. The workers saw none of this in their paychecks. On June 27, 1917, in nearby Bisbee, 4,000 workers demanded higher wages and an end to the dual wage system. Boasted by the support of large numbers of Mineros, the Wobblies called a strike, war or no war. Walter Douglas, president of Phelps Dodge, had no patience for the demands. Those who are not for us are against us. The strikers are getting further and further outside the citizens of this country who place devotion to flag above every other consideration. An infected sore may well become a cancer if it is not cut out. Walter Douglas. Phelps Dodge quickly retaliated. They put the story out that the miners tunneled underground, that they were German spies, and they were going to blow up the Bisbee Post Office. The mining company took over the telephone company, the Western Union. They put guards on it, all incoming and outgoing traffic. You could not come into Bisbee and you could not get word out without uh, mining company permission. Early on the morning of July 12, 1917, vigilantes armed by Phelps Dodge arrested 2,000 strikers. At gunpoint, the prisoners were marched into the downtown plaza. Those who pledged loyalty to the company were released. Everyone else was marched to the edge of town. My father was operating a jitney service. That was a long distance taxi and a local taxi too. His customers, I assume, would have been mostly the miners. When they started running the people out of town, they came and got him early in the morning. Twelve hundred prisoners were loaded into cattle cars of the El Paso and Southwestern Railroad, owned by Phelps Dodge. Packed fifty to a car, they were taken two hundred miles to Columbus, New Mexico. They were dumped in the desert with no food or water and threatened with death if they returned to Bisbee. Phelps Dodge announced, any talk of their coming back is nonsense. They will not be allowed to come back. The serious business of this district is the mining of copper ore, not the building of nightly schools of anarchism. A year later, a commission appointed by President Woodrow Wilson condemned the Bisbee deportation as it came to be known. It was called a grave violation of the law and the Constitution. Unions would not return to Arizona for 25 years. Well, all you got to do is get the public stirred up and they'll... freedom is out the window. What is it? Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. And if, you, if you're not eternally vigilant, you're going to lose your liberty. And the Mexicans didn't have any to begin with, and the rest of them didn't have much more, as a matter of fact. So, talk about civil liberties being eliminated for war profiteering. You get the public stirred up and freedom is out the window. Now, how many times, students, have you heard or learned about this experience in the past 10 years? And as that one uh, labor lawyer was sharing, that eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Uh, he is primarily quoting Thomas Jefferson, because if you are not vigilant, you will lose your liberty. 
And as he shared, the Mexicans didn't have any, and the rest, not much more. So at gunpoint, Mexicans are going to be sent across the border at Columbus, New Mexico. And it took a while for the white workers to be deported back to the Appalachian Mountain states where they originated. One of the curious things about this particular deportation was that Buffalo soldiers from El Paso, Texas, are going to be recruited. This was a, a regiment that had been used to uh, round up the Apaches, and they were, this was a regiment of black soldiers that were recruited simply because blacks could run faster than whites to capture Native Americans. And Native Americans would call them Buffalo soldiers. So the Buffalo soldiers were uh, one of the last groups that were still remaining and they were at Fort Bliss, uh, a fort that, stationed in El, that was in El Paso. And these soldiers from El Paso, Texas, these Buffalo soldiers, are going to be recruited to build a tent city and to cook for the white workers who were part of the Bisbee deportation. So while these white workers were being processed and sent back home, the Buffalo soldiers provided them with tents and food. And this is an amazing story. It's straight out of Arizona's racist legacy. So we should not be surprised at what Arizona is doing today. Now, let's come to appreciate some of the most important advocates for a just society who argued not just for political democracy, but economic democracy, social equality, and an end to gender bias and racism. Let's take a look at different members of the industrial workers of the world. Big Bill Haywood, Elizabeth Gurney Flynn, Ben Fletcher, Joe Hill, and Frank Little. These people offered up their lives so that we might have it better today. So, students, please appreciate how the textbook shares with you the participation and the struggle to achieve justice in this nation. Now, William Dudley Haywood, better known as Big Bill Haywood, was a founding member and leader of the industrial workers of the world. He was a member of the executive committee of the Socialist Party, of America. And during the first two decades of the 20th century, he was involved in several important labor battles, including the Colorado Labor Wars, the Lawrence Textile Strike, and other textile strikes in Massachusetts and New Jersey. Haywood was frequently the target of prosecutors. And in 1918, he was one of 101 IWW members convicted of violating the Espionage Act during the first Red Scare. While out of prison during an appeal of his conviction, Haywood would fled to the recently formed Soviet Republic and he spent the remaining years of his life there. Now, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, <clears throat> she was a labor leader, an activist, and a feminist who played a leading role in the industrial workers of the world. Flynn was a founding member of the American Civil Liberties Union and she was a visible proponent of women's rights birth control, and women's suffrage. And she organized campaigns amongst garment workers in Pennsylvania, amongst silk weavers in New Jersey, amongst restaurant workers in New York, and miners in Minnesota, Montana, and Washington, and most importantly, the textile workers in Massachusetts. Now, she is noted for numerous quotes, but two of her most famous quotes are, history has a long-range perspective. It ultimately passes stern judgment on tyrants and vindicates those who fought, suffered, were imprisoned, and died from, for human freedom against political oppression and economic slavery. And another famous quote, we believe that the class struggle existing in society is expressed in the economic power of the master on the one side and the growing economic power of the workers on the other side. Meeting in open battle and now and again, but meeting in continual daily conflict over which shall have the largest share of labor's product and the ultimate ownership of the means of life. And that was Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. Then there is Ben Fletcher, Benjamin Harris, Harrison Fletcher. He was an early 20th century African-American labor leader and a public speaker. He was a prominent member of the IWW in an era when few African-Americans were permitted in American unions and fewer African Americans belonged to more liberal organizations. Fletcher was a prominent mender, member of the Industrial Workers of the World's Philadelphia branch of Longshoremen. That branch was called Local 8. 
And in May of 1913, thousands of longshoremen struck for better wages and union recognition. And following the strike, <clears throat> Fletcher led Local 8 and revealed how race was used to divide workers. And he argued that workers shared a more important identity, that of class. Fletcher argued that unions could overcome the challenge. Under Fletcher's organizing skills, African-American longshoremen belonged on equal terms to an organization that proved that interracialism was not only possible but essential to true working class might. Then there is Joe Hill. Hill was a Swedish-American labor activist, a songwriter, and a member of the Industrial Workers of the World. A native Swedish speaker, he learned English during the early 1900s while working various jobs from New York to San Francisco. So Joe Hill, as an immigrant worker, frequently faced unemployment and underemployment. He became a popular songwriter and a cartoonist for the IWW. His songs expressed the harsh, combative life of an itinerant workers and the necessity of organizing to improve conditions for working people. Joe Hill willingly died on behalf of the movement to advance the cause of working people world worldwide. And he wrote Big Bill Haywood before his execution, advising him, don't waste, don't waste any time in mourning, organize. So that is Joe Hill. Then there is Frank Little. Frank Little was an organizer who will be lynched in Butte, Montana in 1917 for his union and anti-war activities. He joined the Industrial Workers of the World in 1906. He organized miners, lumberjacks, and oil field workers. And he told friends that he had Native American blood and that his mother was Native American. Little was a strong opponent of World War I. And in early July 1917, Little arrived in Butte, Montana to help organize copper miners. And he led a miners' strike against the Anaconda Copper Company. And in the early hours of August 1st of 1917, six masked men broke into Little's hotel room. He was beaten and taken to the edge of town where he was lynched from a railroad trestle. So, Big Bill Haywood, Elizabeth Gurney Flynn, Ben Fletcher, <coughs> Joe Hill, and Frank Little <clears throat> offered up their lives so that we might have it better today. So <clears throat> again, <clears throat> let's appreciate their participation in a struggle to achieve justice in this nation. And we're going to go to a, a, a film clip that provides us a scene from a very a, 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 a Academy Award-winning film called Reds that was produced and directed and acted in by Warren Beatty. And Warren Beatty in this film attempted to give credit or to try to share with the American public the significance of the IWW and what happened during World War I. Let's go to a film clip that helps us appreciate the significance of IWW as it worked to organize the unskilled. And how many days a week? Seven days. Seven every day? Sir, you don't come to work on Sunday. Don't come on Monday. And what do you make an hour? Twice says. How many times have they slammed the door in your face? Because the labor you do is called unskilled. That's right, though. Well, the IWW is not going to turn you down because you're unskilled. Is it him, George? Or skilled. Or black. Or white. Or yellow. Seven days a week. And what do you make an hour? Ten cents an hour. One big union. All workers belong to the big union. I'm working for a lathe worker named Pasquale Alberti. Uh, he had an industrial accident. He got his leg crushed, do you know? Yeah, sure, Harvard. Is that what they want to read about in Greenwich Village now? Industrial accidents? And for that, we need power. And there's only one way to get power. Organize. All the workers together. One big union. And the war the IWW wants you to get into is class war. Not a war in Europe. War against the capitalists. You'll never get anything or anywhere until the whole working class belongs to one big... All right, gentlemen. You've got 20 seconds to vacate the premises.
May I ask on what authority? On my authority. This is an illegal assembly. Excuse me, officer. These men have the legal right to assemble. That's all they're doing. We know what the hell they're doing. What the hell are you doing? Me? You. I write. You write? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. You wrong. It is important to understand and to look at the progressive era as a middle-class, scientific, humanitarian response to industrialization and the modernization process. Immigrants are part of the working classes, but immigrants are not literate enough to write their struggles. A middle-class native, as opposed to immigrant Americans, they are white-collar, entrepreneurial, college-educated citizens. And there is a very strong middle-class tradition in the United States. So if we can go to the last uh, slide. The middle class reshapes American society in this reform period. So in what we have been studying in this class between the period 1890 to 1914, the United States middle class acted as a great mediator between the rich and the poor, preventing war or revolution or civil war between the two classes. Although this is a generalization, compared to events happening around the world, most other industrializing societies do not have a middle class. And this middle class is who supports intellectuals, and these intellectuals are the ones that provide the economic, political, and social ability to act as mediators. Now, how are they able to do it? Well, progressive intellectuals generated ideas about how the state should take on a new role and become the main vehicle for change. The state should intervene and mediate between capital and labor. And so in the progressive reform period, we had two presidential administrations who mediated between capital and labor. Teddy Roosevelt called it the square deal. Uh, Woodrow Wilson called it the new freedom. Progressive reform saw the development of federal agencies designed to assist the masses. For example, the Department of Labor. This is where we get bureaucracy. This is where we get federal regulations. Federal regulations, they're very important. They are a part of the civil rights movement that quietly began during the Civil War. Now remember, students, people create their own history. It is not created by some illusionary force. All classes of people from all sectors of society have a stake in making society work for them. Life is not dictated from above. Life is not dictated from below. But life is determined by people actively struggling to change the system or to make the system work, to make it more humane. And this generation of people gave our generation something to work with. And it is your job as a student to determine what that something is. Because social movements need activists. These are people who are willing to take risks, to put themselves in the line for issues that are larger than themselves. And they reshape society by becoming the vehicle for change. Many offered up their lives for the hope of a better society. And so this generation put up their lives for us so that we might have it a little bit better. We have a responsibility to understand, to see their generational experience, to appreciate the history that they bestowed us with. So progressive reform, in essence, is the intrusion of the state in the market on behalf of people instead of business. Now, Progressive reform could not have come about without movements for change, without socialist organizing, because it is the socialist importance that leads to a discussion of how to create a more humane capitalist society. So we need to um, appreciate movements because movements lead to reform. Again, I ask you as students, do not be afraid of socialism. Ignore your rights and they will go away. And that's the end of this particular session.